Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Teacher Cast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and thank you so much for joining us today and making Teacher Cast your home for professional development. Welcome to Teacher Cast Podcast, episode number 200. That is right, guys. Today we are celebrating two amazing milestones. Eight years of the Teacher Cast podcast and episode number 200. And today we're celebrating it with a good friend of ours. I want to introduce Mr. Travis Allen. He is an amazing entrepreneur, edupreneur, and he is the owner and creator of something called iSchool Initiative. We're going to be talking all about that and some of the great things that he has been doing, especially this year at the ISTE conference. Travis, how are you today? Welcome to the program. I'm doing great. Glad to be here and happy to know that I'm that 200 episode. It is so nice to have you. Now, you and I have a lot of stuff in common. We're going to be unpacking business. We're going to be unpacking how to start. We're going to be unpacking things like how to keep your students involved in their learning experiences. But for anybody who doesn't know iSchool Initiative and doesn't know a little bit about you, tell us, who is Travis Allen? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So, like I said, my name is Travis, and and I started this organization about nine years ago now at this point. And I started actually as a high school student uh, when I was uh, in a senior year of high school. I loved technology. I loved what it could do for me and my own education. Uh, One day I decided to take notes on my smartphone, but the policy in my school district was no cell phones allowed. And so my device was confiscated. I went home in trouble, and uh, that was the catalyst that led me to create a YouTube video on how technology could transform education and uh, and began this whole journey. I I love the idea that it is something that affected you. It could have been negatively, but you actually turned that negative into a positive. You know, it's um, great parenting. I do what all good kids do. Uh, I came and complained to my mom and dad, and, uh, and my dad eventually looked at me and said, shut up, stop whining about it. If you don't like education, then do something about it. Go impact change. Whereas I think most people that, especially parents, response would be, you need to listen to your teacher. You need to do what they say. But my parents had a very different approach to how they view problems and encouraged me to be a problem solver. Now, how did your your teachers take that? I mean, obviously you came back the next day or the next couple days and you had a idea you had a, a thought a game plan or what, what what was those first couple of days like when you're like all right you know you guys kicked me out but i have an idea now yeah so you know i took the next four months um i went back to school i talked to several teachers about my this idea you know imagine if every student had an ipod touch what could you do in the classroom how would it transform it and uh, and there were several teachers of course who were very supportive and helped me make that video and then there were several who were uninterested or didn't want to get involved and so it was just a whole lot of research. It was the most invested I've been in building anything at that point. And I, I spent every waking moment uh, building this video, pulling it together, asking for feedback um, from, from as many stakeholders as I could. And uh, you know, after launching it, it went viral. And, and it's what kind of set me uh, up for where I am today, which I never thought I'd be here. You know, there's a lot of teachers that are out there listening who have uh, listened to us here on the TeacherCast podcast talk about things like building your EDU brand, creating channels for themselves, making those things happen in a way that, you know, might not be possible a few years ago. If you guys have any questions for for Travis or if you guys would like to ask any questions of the show, of course, you guys can reach out to us over here on TeacherCast. You can find us on Twitter at TeacherCast or leave us a voice message over on teachercast.net. We'd love to hear from you guys. Now, Travis, talk to us a little bit about this because so many people have asked, what is a viral video? How does it work? What does it, what goes into making something? You, you basically just told a story of how you crafted this video. Most people go and shoot the camera and post it and then see what happens. Talk to us a little bit about how you plan these things out because there's a lot of people that are interested in, in taking content and making it go somewhere. Yeah, you know, I I hear that all the time. Oh, you know, you're so lucky that it got traction, that it went viral, that it did all these things. And I always tell people that it was very intentional and took a lot of hard work. Um, You know, basically what I did for uh, months, you know, I had 100 views for for the first several months. And I would basically spend every waking moment trying to find key influencers in the industry. And I was new to the industry. I've, I've never been a teacher at the time. I'd never done anything in education. And so I just started finding all these amazing influencers, you know, podcasters, bloggers, you name it. 
And I would read through their stuff and I would post and I would comment. I would go through social media and I would say, you know, hey, love what you're doing here. Have you seen my video? Have you seen what I'm doing here? And after doing that over and over and over, eventually the right person sees it, right? And so in this case, uh, you know, I, I found out only years later that there was a moment in time when Steve Jobs found the video uh, and started promoting it through Apple Education. And that was kind of what um, made it go from a very small unknown video to a little bit larger. But it was a lot of hard work to get it to that point. And what was that like, that moment that you found out that Steve Jobs, of, of all the people on the planet, kind of dug what you were doing? Yeah, it was pretty incredible. And I, I didn't find out till years later, actually after he already passed away, uh, because I've been work I you know, ran across several Apple employees who kind of told me how they stumbled upon my video. And it's an incredible feeling, right? And it's it's a feeling of just this sense of sense of accomplishment. But you know, whether that happens or not, it still takes a lot of hard work to do this. You know, I'll, I'll give you another example of this. I've got a social media campaign uh, that I've created for two years called the hashtag Travis Meets Musk. And it's basically my goal in life to uh, get some mentorship and advice from, from Elon. And, uh, and so I've been pushing out this movement for two years. I've had, you know, thousands of people tweet him. No luck yet, um, but it's all about really just grit and, and doing it uh, over and over that is pretty awesome. Uh, t talk to us about this. Is this is just you know different blog posts? Are you writing blog posts or, or putting out content specifically to catch his attention? Is it just you figure if I can get a million people to use the hashtag, he's got to see this thing? So I do motivational speaking keynotes for conference and education. I end every keynote saying, "Join me in this movement and send a tweet to Elon why you think him and I should have lunch <laughs> together." And so my hope is if enough people join the cause, he'll have to say yes to my lunch request, basically. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you, for, for me, um, not only do I think he's just an amazing entrepreneur who's shaking things up, but he's the only individual that I can really point to, especially in, in uh, who's alive today, who is taking on government industries, industries that don't change typically, and he's, you know, he's radically creating change. And I feel like that's what education uh, needs. And so I'll send him a tweet occasionally saying, you know, hey, if you want to colonize Mars, uh, you can't do it if we uh, if we don't send competent problem solvers first and foremost um, and just kind of just hoping to get his attention. So that's pretty awesome. I mean, there's so many students out there that like you have these dreams, have these people that they look up to. And often they ask, how do I do it? I mean, we're living in this age where social media and, and anybody on the planet, essentially, is just a tweet away. Um, what other ways are you uh, trying to get, I don't want to say celebrities, but what, are you, what other ways are you trying to get people's attention online? And, and how have you seen it work in the past? So, you know, most of our success has really been built around a lot of face-to-face -face bringing awareness. Uh, we've launched a movement. And we've been we've been pushing you know our vision for education and what we hope to see from a very unique vo uh, voice, right? So we've been pushing that student voice. Uh, that's where we stem from. That's what we've been all about. And so uh, we've actually had a whole lot of success. You know, the online platform, social media, thing like that, things like that have been great. But most of our success has been from hundreds of conferences and speaking and attending them uh, all over the world. You know, we've been in 13 countries, 43 states. Uh, and we've presented to over 350,000 educators in the last couple of years here. And so that's really been how we've been able to get the most uh, traction uh, through attrition. Now, you and I met uh, a few weeks ago in Philadelphia at the ISTE conference. And well, first of all, what did you think of ISTE? I have attended ISTE every year since I've graduated high school. So about eight or I think this was my ninth year at ISTE straight. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, you know, I call it the Super Bowl of education technology. It's the place where all the influencers are. I'm a huge fan of it. I love what they do. I love the message they put out there and they put on a great event. And, and your company, um, iSchool Initiative, was working um, with a great company, Cisco, and you guys were taking people through a digital escape room. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about some of the things that was happening uh, in Philadelphia this year? Yeah. And, you know, I'll take a step back before I jump into that and sure. just say that you know, for us, we, we're a company, an organization that provides immersive experiences in the professional development world of education technology. We believe that we should be practicing what we preach. If we're saying that teachers should be hands-on problem solving and, and create a you know, fun learning environment, then our PD should role model that. 
And so we create, we have all sorts of experiences where we've got what we call our escape the bus. It's a 40 foot vehicle where we trap teachers and administrators inside and they have 30 minutes to use technology to see if they have what it takes to escape. The whole concept of that though, is to role model what be less helpful looks like, what allowing people to collaborate and work together to find their own pathway to success looks like, and also demonstrate how we think a more effective way of uh, creating adoption of technology, right? I'm not gonna sit here and teach you how to use a 3D printer for two hours. Instead, I'm gonna create a challenge, an experience, where you have to teach yourself as a group of a team of people to 3D print something. So with that said, we launched the biggest production we've ever done at ISTE in partnership with Cisco. We created an escape room building on site as the 20 by 30 booth experience with them. And it was a, a Mars classroom simulator. And so the concept, the theme we had was that <clears throat> we're here uh, colonizing and creating the first school ever on Mars. And in order to do this, we need to recruit the best and brightest educators from around the world. And so we're here, we've created a simulator to test your ability to see if you're certified to teach on Mars and go through this compelling experience. And so it was a 25 minute um, challenge where you have to go through and use technology uh, to solve all these hypothetical problems on Mars you'd experience. It was a ton of fun. And uh, you know, attendees spent on average 45 minutes at our booth with Cisco, which is far more than I think most companies can say. Oh, by far. I mean, there's, you know, five or six football fields long was was the was the was the vendor booth this year it was absolutely massive and every time i came by the cisco booth you had you know hundreds of teachers all there having fun smiling interacting with each other strangers and and it was pretty awesome what what does it actually take to put something like that together like when did you start planning this insane amount of production and a large team uh behind me so just to put it in perspective, you know, we probably planned it four months in advance. We really got serious about it. Um, and I had probably my entire team at some point, uh, about 12 of us on and off working on this project uh, pretty regularly. But then you add all, all the Cisco people, you know, our job was we, we focused on the design of the experience, uh, the gameplay and incorporating the technology, but Cisco had to build the booth. Uh, they had to provide all the technology, make sure it works beautifully. And so it was a team of, you know, 30 to 40 people on and off that worked together to create that experience uh, and about four months of dedicated planning wow. and a whole lot. Of, of, so we were the first ones, the setup time at ISTE, Cisco was one of the first ones there. And Sunday night, we were the last company still setting up, working through kinks at midnight, the show opens at 7 a.m. for last minute setup. At midnight, the crew for the exhibit hall had to come and say, you guys got to leave. We can't let you in here anymore. And, uh, and they had to kick us out. That's how much la like, you know, challenging but uh, big production this was. There was so much buzz around that place. There was so much technology being used all in this amazing, uh, I, I, if maybe we can get some pictures of it, we'll stick it on the, on yeah. the, uh, on the podcast. Cause it, it talking about it really doesn't do it justice here, but it was just absolutely amazing to see all these different interactive parts going on. Could you take us through a little bit of it of, of when a teacher walked in there, what were they actually yeah. doing? So we actually had two gaming experiences that you could participate in. And, and that's what we do, right? We're all about gamification and what that could do for learning and, and how we can engage people. So first I will say that uh, players who came to our booth, they became players and they earn raffle tickets, uh, uh, basically like you would at a Dave and Buster's or a Chuck, and che Chuck E. Cheese. You earn tickets for every problem station that you go through and solve as a team of people. And then you can spend those on prizes. We had thousands of uh, different prizes you could choose from at our prize store. And so one of the many experiences you could do is our 25 minute escape room. And so when you walk in, we immerse you into the experience from the beginning An AI voice welcomes you into the experience and sets the stage. And basically the AI voice comes in and says, welcome to the Mars classroom simulator. Uh, in front of you are eight different nodes that you must uh, systems that you must turn back online, the oxygen, you know, node, the power node and so on. And so you're then put in a team of eight people, 
Each of you are given a identity, a character, a persona that you play. So one of you might be the principal, one of you might be the student, and together you have to use technology to unlock a secret room into the medical bay area. You have to uh, do a video call to call people on the outside of the booth, which was Mission Control Earth, in order to solve some of your challenges. Uh, we had this really cool experience where there's a fisheye camera security lens inside the room. And on the outside, you put on a VR goggle headset and it puts you in the room. And so we created a lot of moments in time when to escape the room on the inside, you had to collaborate with random attendees walking by on the outside. I, I'm sitting here going, wow, you did all that in four months. That it's, that's pretty mm -hmm. amazing with everything. Like, when, what, what, what do you want to do next year for Anaheim, I got to ask? Have you, have you started thought, thinking about that? It's going to be bigger, better. Uh, California is our stomping ground right now, so we want to go all out. Um, I can't say too much, but we are in going to continue partnering with Cisco. And this was the first time we did this production. Imagine how much better we could do it knowing what we know now. So we're going to start a new hashtag right here on this podcast, Musk at ISTE. And we'll see if we can get him going with everything. Now that I'm all for. That would be amazing. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking over here at your website, ischoolinitiative.com. And I want to go back to the bus because everything that you're talking about, this immersive gamification, learning everything, you guys have a fantastic program that you can bring this bus to school districts. Um, you mentioned it a little bit a, a few minutes ago. How does this work? How does a school district connect with you guys and bring this to their community? So we have many services that focus on creating growth mindset and creating uh, adoption of innovation with school districts. And we shift culture uh, through our professional development. And so one of those things is our escape the bus. The way it works, it's a team building uh, professional development, primarily for educators and administrators. Now we do have student teams come on and play, but really to get the return on the, the investment, we recommend your teachers and administrators play. And so what happens is we schedule with a school, we bring the bus to uh, a district office or school building, and we can rotate up to about 75 people uh, to play a 12 minute, uh, excuse me, 30 minute challenges, uh, escape challenge that 12 people can fit in. And so we do it for 30 minutes, only about 30% of our teams escape. Uh, we collect all the data on, on who escapes and who doesn't. We create a live leaderboard for your entire district so you can kind of compete with one another. And then we do a 15 to 20 minute debrief afterwards. And that's the real value. That's why this is PD. And I'll give you a simple taste for the conversation we have. You know, one of the things that, that we feel is, again, this concept of let's be less helpful in education. I ask people, you know, when you struggled, you weren't given instructions, you struggled, but you finally click open that lock and it goes click. How do you feel in that moment, right? People are cheering, they're screaming, they're excited, they're running around. And so if I instead wrote up on a whiteboard and I said, here are the three steps to unlock that box. Step one, do this. Step two, go do this. How would you feel in the moment you click it open? Mm -hmm. Eh, you accomplished a checklist. And so this is effectively what we do sometimes in education when we spoon feed so much information up front. We rob our students of the most enjoyable part of learning, which is the struggle, overcoming something we didn't know we were going to overcome, and finding my own path to success to solve a problem. That That's extremely powerful. I'm, I'm listening to you talking about this and I'm putting myself back in the position of that tech coach of working with adults and getting them to think differently to then teach differently. And it really is about creating that culture where if you put the learning in the hands of the student rather than out of the mouths of the teachers, the students are going to be better off in the long run. Yeah, and and that's, you know... We struggle with this concept. So when we think about professional development, um, most of our PD, we kind of, we try to avoid us telling educators, us telling administrators what they should do in the classroom or should not do. And we really try to create experiences that lead them to their own conclusions, right? That bus experience, we don't tell them that example of, you know, what, what did it feel like when you open a box? We simply ask them questions of, what did you get out of this? And we facilitate that conversation so that they come to their own realizations. So let's go back. You had your video. It was founded by it was found by Steve Jobs. It was it was went viral the whole campaign. What's what's been going on between then 
and now. You're early 20s and suddenly you're an entrepreneur. You're building this company. Talk to us a little bit about some of your successes in growth and talk to us maybe about a struggle or two that you had to overcome as a business person. There are plenty of those. My two passions are education and entrepreneurship. I could talk all day about these two subjects. Um, and that was my my business degree. So I went to college for business uh, straight out of high school. And my dad gave me a choice. I was working at the local Chick-fil-A restaurant in my high school neighborhood. And uh, my dad basically said, look, you've got two options. Um, you can either uh, can transfer to the local Chick-fil-A uh, to pay for your college um, and, and kind of work as you go, or you could take out student loans, uh, you could go in debt and you could pursue this high school initiative thing full time and see what you can make of it. I chose the latter, right? Best decision I've made. And, um, for the first three, four years of my college experience, I basically created a student club on my college campus. And at one point I had 40, um, college students who were part of my club that I launched. um, And we were just kind of getting a feel for who are we? What were we meant to do? And the cat that the really the the pivot point was in 2012. When we decided to take this serious, we went from 40 volunteers to say, what could we do with 10 full time people? And we raised in two months, we raised $150,000 to go on a nationwide tour. And what we did is we we built this giant, you know, we, we rented this uh, this tour bus that had 12 bunk beds, and we lived in this bus for 45 days that summer in 12, 2012. And uh, we basically, we booked 21 cities all across the country, starting in Georgia, going all the way to California, up to New York, back to Georgia again, uh, 21 stops, 21 cities in 45 days. Wow. And each city, we did a different conference that either we put on or we attended an already existing conference, which our big anchor point was ISTE. Brought the whole team to ISTE. We brought the bus. We parked it outside. We dropped off. And it looked like NASCAR because we had all these sponsors that paid for it. Um, but along that journey, when we went on tour, uh, we learned some really valuable things. Number one, living on a bus is a really dumb idea. Um, and number two, 45 days is not enough to change education. And so we, from that point on, created a for-profit arm of what then was our nonprofit and asked ourselves, what are we best in the world at? What are the things that we can uniquely do to this industry to play a role in shaping and molding it? And so from there, we created programs, services, and we created technology uh, that really empowered districts to roll out the vision we had for education and what we've been you know, preaching in our keynotes uh, that we've been doing for that past four years, it all kind of came together. And, and so we started creating solutions. And again, the, the one last thing I'll say here is we did this because so many people would hear us keynote and hear these messages and say, wow, you got me fired up. I get why. How do I do it? Right. How do I go down this pathway that you speak of? And we want it to be that happen. When somebody listens to your keynote, what is that message? What do you want your users to walk away with and get not only supercharged with, but take action on? Yeah, it comes down to we believe that we need to build human intelligence. We can no longer compete with where technology is at. Artificial intelligence is taking over so many aspects of the world around us. And so anything that's based on memorizing, anything that's based on information and solving problems quickly with these, in, this information is happening from technology. And so we want to invest in human intelligence. We want to invest in skills that make us unique to us and that allows us to differentiate from technology. The thing that we really harp on is that if all you do is ask Googleable questions, you should be replaced by Google. Because that means that we're not we're not doing something that technology can't do for us. And that's a really difficult task. And, and we actually do exercises with teachers where we break them down into, okay, we, how do we think about how we teach our students today? How do we put a spin on it to where we're moving completely away from Googleable questions? It's an interesting way that you put that uh, because right now I kind of feel guilty when you say that I just – one of the things I walked away from ISTE with was actually a Google home. And now I'm actually teaching my five-year-olds how to ask Google questions. 
how do we break that, right? Because we, again, as tech coaches, we talk to our teachers about that same subject. Ask them something that they can't directly look up the answer to on their Chromebooks, on their iPads. And you still have teachers that are looking at you funny, like, well, why can't I ask those questions? What are some alternatives to that? And and sometimes even for the tech coach, you, you kind of get into that, well, this is a good example. This is not a good example for anybody. Let's just set the table here for a second for anybody who's listening and doesn't quite understand what we're saying. Could you give us an example of maybe a yeah. Googleable question? And then how could that question be turned around? So I, I break things into um, there's a couple elements to this. So it's not always that it can't be Googled. Um, and I give this example. It goes back to this idea of be less helpful. So I'm going to start here, and then I'm going to go back to this idea of asking questions that can't be Googled. You know, my parents taught me how to tie my shoes, as most parents teach their kids. Um, but I realized not too long ago that my parents taught me the wrong way to tie my shoes. I, I tie them very inefficiently, and I waste five seconds of my life every single day for the rest of my life, right? And so there's levels of helicopter teaching or helicopter parenting that we create that I think uh, stifle problem solving and the development of that critical thinking skill. And so the, the worst of the worst I call uh, Velcro shoes till our kids are 18. And that's basically solving the problem by ignoring it and giving them Velcro shoes. The next layer of helpfulness is I'm going to teach my kids what I know. And the problem I think with that is that our kids will only become as good as us. And I think the goal as parents is we want our kids to become better than us, right? And so the third layer is rather than teaching our kids what we know, simply allow students, uh, allow your child to, to, as they trip and go through this process, say, wow, man, that's gonna really hurt until you figure out uh, how to take care of that problem, right? And what they'll find is you can actually go watch a YouTube video, how do I tie my shoes, rewatch at your own pace a one minute video that shows you the most collective wisdom, the most efficient way of tying your shoe. So the first step is just identifying to allow students to use Google in general as a regular problem solving tool every day in the classroom. Any test that doesn't allow you to use Google is by definition a terrible test in my mind. And so then we go in a little bit further than that. And that's how we move in this direction of asking questions that can't be Googled. Now, when I ask teachers to brainstorm this, they usually go into opinion-based questions or they go into uh, the theory of something. So a simple example of a teacher might give me is, uh, how to solve hunger. Now, is that a Googleable question? I would argue it's very Googleable. I can go Google and find the, the hundred different ways to solve hunger. But what happens to the question when you simply remove the first three words of that question? How do you solve hunger? And instead, the question becomes not a question, but solve hunger. And so our dream of how we move teachers and education and schools into this problem solving human intelligence era is we have to create schools as safe places to solve problems. Imagine every day if your only objective as a student was what real world problems can I solve in the community around me? And as a teacher, if your only objective was what problems can we solve as a classroom today? Would you enjoy teaching more? And would you enjoy school more from a student perspective? And what skills would you learn along the way at attempting to solve the, some of the greatest problems we currently face. You might fail, but you'll learn a lot. That is absolutely awesome. And and I'm, I'm sitting here taking notes on all these different things here. Of course, if you're looking for more information, it is TeacherCast podcast episode number 200. We're talking today with Travis Allen. Um, Travis, you have an amazing story. And, and first of all, Congratulations to all your successes and, and you know everything that's going on for you. I, I want to kind of wrap up today by having you talk a little bit about your your program here of students leading education because you're running a competition. Talk to us a little bit about this and how do we learn more? So SLED is our bread and butter. It's our core program. It's uh, what we're best known for. And it really is the thing that's role modeling everything that I just said we like to see in education. So SLED stands for Students Leading Education. It's a middle school and high school club that schools can enroll in with us. And upon enrolling in this club, you basically are part of a nationwide community, a movement uh, to empower students to have leadership in their education and empower them to be problem solvers. 
And the way this works is we kickstart your program by coming in and doing a three-day training program with your students that are going to be part of this club. And we focus on developing some skill sets, but the main objective is on day two of the program, we invite administrators to come in and pitch to the students what their greatest problem as a school is that they're facing right now. So administrators might say things like, we don't have enough technology, we don't have enough funds, teachers don't know how to use technology, we don't have uh, access to healthy produce in our cafeteria, right? And so they treat the students as consultants. The students then have 24 hours to pitch a project idea on how they're going to solve those problems over the course of the entire year. And so they pitch them in front of the superintendent, judges, all sorts of things. And then they have the entire year to work as a club to implement those project ideas. They can upload those project ideas into our nation national database of projects, and they can compete in our annual competition where uh, students are basically uh, submitting how much impact their projects had, what they did, uh, what problems did they solve, all sorts of things. And just to give you an example, we've had a student team raise over $250,000 in grants for technology. We had a student who student group who launched their own farmers market to produce uh, produce for their cafeteria. We had students who took who created a, a um, district wide social media campaign to stop cyberbullying. It was called hashtag Niceness is Priceless, and it went viral because it was from students for students. We have students who are training their teachers on how to use technology and helping troubleshoot tech on campus. The list goes on. We didn't tell students what to do. We created an environment that said, what problems need solving, now let's go solve them. I imagine if every teacher out there used their classroom as a vehicle to help students learn how to solve the problems, that would be pretty cool this year. Where, where would we go to get more information about SLED and the other great things that you guys are doing at iSchool Initiative? So our club is studentled.com, studentled.com. Uh, you can learn more about our program there. Uh, we've also are rolling out some really incredible micro credentialing. Uh, it's all built around badges. So every chapter can earn badges for achievements uh, and impact that they have uh, throughout the year. And really SLED is just, again, it's a, um, it's a one piece of a bigger equation. We have a certified teacher program which is the same concept. We empower teachers to be problem solvers. We empower them to create projects for change. And we empower them to create uh, escape and immersive professional development that they can implement in their district. So many more programs, uh, but you know what it comes down to is we're here to create schools that become safe places mm -hmm. to solve problems and challenge students to get uncomfortable every day. As we look ahead with, with everything that's happening in education today. And, and, you know, you obviously are right there leading the charge to get students involved, to change the way education is. And you are all over the place with your bus, with, with working with Cisco. I got to ask the question that's probably on everybody's mind right now. Since I'm going to say since Elon is probably listening to this podcast, if he calls you and says, would you like to go to Mars one day? What is your answer? Would you be able to... <laughs> Would you be interested in going to Mars, Travis Allen? Uh, I'm going to say family first. Uh, I've got a, I've got a three-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old, so it depends on a whole lot of variables, right? If I was just me thinking of myself, I'd be the first one on that on the first flight out. Even though uh, I think Elon himself said most of those people will die, um, but uh, so for me though, it's uh, you know my own kids and my family and time with them is. A uh, huge priority, and so I would do whatever's best for us as a unit. So next year at, at, at Anaheim, if we see the Cisco iSchool Initiative SpaceX, I believe, rocket ship um, <laughs> escape room, we're going to come up with another hashtag here for you here. Yep. I, I, I think we got to do that. Guys, if you're listening, please check out uh, all the great stuff over on SLED, over at studentled.com, a fantastic program helping students really create their own futures. I love it. And also check out everything at iSchool Initiative. Travis, I, I, as a serious question, what do you see as your future? Where, where do you see yourself in, in next year in Anaheim? And, and where would you like to see this um, over the next couple of years? So our company's based in Georgia, and I moved out to California uh, about a year ago because we've just been exploding out here. So where we want to be, um, you know, we have rapid growth right now. Uh, we want to see hundreds of more chapters open up in our SLED program. We have a couple new vehicles being produced in the works potentially here. We've got uh, a huge amount of certified teachers. We certified over 100 teachers 
uh, through three-day trainings in California alone uh, last month. And so we're here uh, continuing to be on the forefront of moving and shaking the industry up and being you know, one of many players uh, that will be the catalyst to an education system that is truly preparing our students for the world. And that is something that students enjoy and, and love being a part of. And so that's, that's our vision. That's where we, where we want to be. Um, for me personally, I want to continue to solve problems. Uh, if the day I stop solving problems in the world is the, the day that I become irrelevant, and I don't see that happening anytime soon. You can find out all the information over at isitravis.com. I love the website. I love everything that you guys are doing. Travis, if I could ask you one thing, please come back on the show and uh, help us help you guys prepare for ISTE 2020 in Anaheim, California. Travis, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure. I appreciate it. And I hope you guys had a great time listening to this episode. If you'd like to be featured on the next 200 episodes of the TeacherCast Educational Network, we would love to have you guys on and feature your stories and your students. After eight years of podcasting, it feels like we are just getting started. Lots of great stuff over on TeacherCast.net. If you're looking to learn how to bring podcasting into your classroom, you can check out the brand new... Uh, podcastingwithstudents.com. We've got everything you need to create, record, edit, and publish your own classroom podcasts. And if you're an instructional technology coach for the first time or for the fifth time, we have some great stuff over at askthetechcoach.com. Check everything out over on teachercast.net. We would love to hear from you guys this school year. So on behalf of Travis and everybody here on the TeacherCast Educational Network, my name is Jeff Bradbury, reminding you to keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.